And now, a pattern of suspicion. Here is Stone Phillips. Good evening. Discrimination, affirmative action, hate crimes. Issues that break down along the fault lines of our racial divide are among the most incendiary that we face as a nation. In recent years, another such issue has ignited even more controversy. Racial profiling. Law enforcement officers allegedly stopping and searching vehicles based on the race of the driver. Many African Americans say it happens every day, calling it painful and humiliating. But police departments insist racial profiling is not a policy they follow. So does it happen? or doesn't it? Dateline has spent more than a year going through millions of traffic stops across the country for the most definitive answer yet. Many are not going to be happy with what we found. Here's John Larson. All cities have to take a look at Cincinnati. Cincinnati is a mirror of many of our cities. If Cincinnati, Ohio is a mirror, no one liked what we saw in the mirror one morning in November. For six minutes, Cincinnati police officers beat an unarmed black man. Although the coroner would later say the beating led to the man's death, in the eyes of the mayor and the county prosecutor, the police action was justified. After all, the 350-pound man high on drugs had attacked the officers. The police officers had a legitimate interest in making absolutely certain that they protected their own lives and their own safety. I don't see him breathing. But not everyone agreed. You see, in Cincinnati, which is mostly white, on duty police there have killed 18 people in nine years. And every one of those killed has been black. We know that white kids run from the police. We know that white people fight police. In this city, they just didn't end up dead. Cincinnati's Reverend Damon Lynch claims what many African Americans believe that every day, without any cameras rolling, Police treat innocent African Americans as suspects, as if they're guilty until proven innocent. It's called racial profiling, and the President of the United States has pledged to bring the practice to an end. Racial profiling is wrong, and we will end it in America. Tonight, the culmination of a 14 month Dateline investigation of racial profiling. New and compelling statistical evidence gathered from Cincinnati and cities across the country. Do police deny millions of Americans the most basic protection promised them in the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, equal protection under the law? Or are charges of racial profiling exaggerated or completely false? Hey, what's the problem, man? She's got a reason. We begin on the streets of Cincinnati, Ohio, a city torn by allegations of racial profiling. Hey, put your hands on the car or you're going to go in cuffs, man. Here, police officer Ron Dammert works one of the nation's roughest neighborhoods. Over the Rhine. In one year, nearly 400 robberies, more than 200 assaults, 10 murders in one small, overwhelmingly black inner city neighborhood. Most of this crime fueled by the only growth industry in sight, drugs. Each block has its own personality. It'll either be marijuana, crack cocaine, there's uh, heroin down here. The drug trade down here, it's all because of the money. On the blocks he patrols, drug dealers try very hard not to get caught. Lookouts on each corner announce the presence of cops. The boys! Boys is the code name for police, a warning for dealers to suspend their trade. The boys! It's just the way the game is played. The dope dealers will tell you it's a game. Don't hate the player, hate, hate the game. Increasingly, police in Cincinnati and across the country have been credited with winning the game, reducing crime, not by sitting back and playing defense, but by playing offense. This alley that we're going back to right now is a popular place for uh, people to smoke crack. Yep, there's two right there. And playing offense is called proactive policing. She just dropped something. Sit down. Sit down. Now watch closely. What are you guys doing back here? 
Dammert hasn't seen any crime being committed, but he says he saw the woman drop something. And he knows, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, if he has a reasonable suspicion, he can begin a search. You don't have any problem if I search you, right? You're not wanted, sir? No, I'm not. The men are searched and released. He then turns his attention to the woman. See, I told you you put something on the step, didn't I? Ma'am, I saw you put it on the step. Yeah, I did. Turn around and put your hands behind your back. He had found a crack pipe right where he said he saw her drop something. She's a relatively long way away. How could you see it? It took me a long time to learn how to catch people. A hunch and a small victory, albeit very small, in the drug war. If you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, I'm going to try to stop it. In any given year, police stop millions of Americans. But it's who they stop and why that's at the heart of the racial profiling debate. We've been labeled as racist, and I wholeheartedly know that that is not true. Does anybody honestly think that I would work in a place that is overwhelmingly African American if I was racist towards them? Nonetheless, you'll soon see how even with the best of cops, and Officer Dammert is that, hand-picked by the department to escort Dateline. How even with Cincinnati's finest, aggressive, proactive policing can breed anger and charges of racial profiling. Okay, guy in a black hoodie right in front of Albert's Market just saw us and headed straight into the store. Officer Dammert has just seen a young black man in a sweatshirt turn away from him and decides for that reason alone the young man is worth talking to. Can I talk to you for a minute, sir? How you doing? Do you have any ID on you? Do you have anything on you you shouldn't have? You look like you're trying to avoid me. No, you saw me coming and you took off around the corner and then saw me and started walking again. You got some weed on you, man? It's just a ticket. You don't it's called stop and talk. Ask a few questions, see if he'll consent to a search. It's all perfectly legal. You ain't got no warrants, right? How much money do you have on you, sir? I have a little over a hundred. Okay. You got a job? Where are you working at, sir? I mean, I was working at Montgomery. Oh, okay. Spread your legs for me. The man has done nothing wrong, hasn't broken any law, but does he fit a certain profile? 51. Well, if you didn't do nothing, man, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Okay, and I do, I do appreciate you cooperating with me, all right? Just short, all right? Just out here trying to get dope off the street, man. I mean, This is how we do it. This is short. Thanks for your cooperation, man. The young man is let go. No incident report is filled out. There'll be no record the stop ever happened. He saw us come around the corner and he turned and started to walk away. Was this yeah, racial profiling? Not in the eyes of Officer Dammert. I thought he had a warrant. I thought he had marijuana. One or the other, maybe both. You're saying I thought. You mean, in other words, you're, you're taking an educated guess? <clears throat> yes. Based on the fact that he turned away? Based on the fact that I've worked in Over the Rhine for five years. How important was it that he was dressed in a hooded sweatshirt, black, standing on the corner? Didn't mean a whole lot to me. His race? No. It was his activity, what he was doing. He saw me and immediately turned away. Is that reason enough to go stop him and eventually search him? Uh, no, no. We showed a tape of the incident to Cecil Thomas, a Cincinnati cop for 27 years, who now runs Cincinnati's Human Relations Commission. That's good enough reason for you to, to maybe uh, go around the block, call your undercover units, and say, hey, I got a guy acting suspicious. You think you can come over here and stake him out and see what he's up to? Anything further than that, you're really on thin ice. Thomas says isolated stops like this may seem minor to white Americans, but he says in the African American community, they happen far too often. Are Cincinnati police profiling people racially? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you just saw it in that film. <laughs> in the film, you just seen it. The same day he was stopped and frisked, the young man arrives at police headquarters, attempting to file a complaint that he'd been profiled and harassed. Do you think I harassed you? Yeah, I mean, I was, oh, come on. I was, I was on the phone. Dammert's supervisor joins them, and Dammert, saying it was not racial profiling, tries to explain the law. You turned and walked again, twice. You turned and walked away from me. That, in that neighborhood, gives me reasonable suspicion to believe that you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing. 
The young man tries to explain what it's like to be stopped, searched, and embarrassed on the street. He asks four separate times to file a complaint, something entirely within his rights, but the officers won't hear of it. Well, you're, you're talking to my boss right now. I don't think he's going to put it on paper because there's no, there's no violation here. I mean, I actually had a right to go saying right now. They even suggest there might be legal consequences. I mean, do you understand there's such a thing as filing a false police report? Do you understand it's a criminal charge? If you, if you try to go through with this and they bring that tape in and they find that you're lying about what you're saying, you know you'd be charged with that? He never files a complaint and leaves feeling his concerns were neither heard nor understood. Can you see how this young man would, would feel like this, this cop targeted me? I mean, I didn't have anything on me. I wasn't selling drugs. I, I turn away from him. That's why he comes up on me. Well, you use the word targeted. Why would I target him? Because he's black? This is, in my opinion, it's good, proactive police work. You didn't get any drugs. You left behind a young man who distrusts you even more, and the animosity grows. Was it worth it? I explained to him numerous times why I did what I did. He didn't want to hear it, so the only other alternative is don't stop him in the first place. You know, if I stop doing that, I'm going to have the community on my back. Why aren't you out there getting these guys? In all fairness, the community might say, yeah, don't, don't stop him. If all he does is turn away from you, don't stop him. Okay. Look for something more. Probably the majority of our major arrests come from minor violations. Do you want me to take drugs off the street? This is how I'm going to do it. If you don't like the way I'm going to do it, don't look at it. But this is how it has to be done. We did check the young man's background and learned something Officer Dammert didn't even know. We learned the young man had two convictions for possessing small amounts of marijuana and cocaine. But on this day, of course, he was clean, and his record had nothing to do with why he was stopped or searched. And this was just one day with one officer. But encounters like this happen all the time. While many good cops, black and white, argue they're just trying to do their job, many African Americans report the issue is much larger than that. And to better understand this, you should understand what happened at the corner of a dark alley one night in Cincinnati. What's that April 7, 2001, an unseasonably warm spring night in Cincinnati, Ohio. Late that night, around 2 a.m. in Over the Rhine, a young man walking down the street is spotted by an off-duty police officer outside the warehouse, a local nightclub. As the officer approaches, the man runs, and a chase is on. 1926. 1926. Uh, we have a suspect, male black, about 6'4", red bandana. Other officers quickly join the pursuit. Okay, cars in the area, copy on that. Two to the subject with open warrants, partly 14 of them, male black. A 27 year old Cincinnati police officer spots the suspect as he runs into a dark alley. As a police car approaches, its camera rolling, you can see the officer run towards the alley and almost immediately, a shot rings out. What the f is that shot fired? Give me a rescue unit. No officer is shot. We have an officer involved shooting. The suspect is down. A single bullet fired from the officer's gun pierces the suspect's heart. He's pronounced dead at 3.02 a.m. The officer later tells investigators he thought the suspect was reaching for a gun. No gun was ever found. By dawn, the identity of the suspect comes to light. The man was 19 years old, a young father with an infant son. The man's name, Timothy Thomas. All they needed to do was to grab him. Instead, they decided to shoot him. For many of Cincinnati's African Americans, the death of Thomas, the latest in a growing number of black men to die at the hands of Cincinnati police, was the last straw. It's like. We the prey, and they the predator. I mean, you know, it's like they out to get us. No reason! No reason! 
Thomas's mother, Angela Leisure. I demand to know why. Within 24 hours, the anger and mistrust the African-American community felt toward its police exploded on the streets. You are ordered to depart the park now. Riot police marched through the streets, firing tear gas and rubber bullets. Days of civil unrest, painful for the city to endure. If the police restrained themselves, then the citizens will restrain themselves. We are we are walking. Walking. We are off the right. corner. Go, 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 let's go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But while it was the death of Timothy Thomas that enraged many in the city, it was the story of what happened to Thomas months before his death that would raise the most disturbing questions. Those questions would launch Dateline on a 14-month investigation revealing new information on racial profiling. Our search began with something as simple as a traffic ticket. Thomas's mother, Angela Leisure. One day Tim came in the house and he was like, Mom, I got two tickets. It's like, two tickets, Mom, for the same thing. Later on that same day, he got two more tickets for the same things in the same area from different police officers. Dateline obtained traffic records that show beginning in February of 2000, as Timothy Thomas drove his friend's car, Cincinnati police began pulling him over and ticketing him at an astounding rate. March 10th, Thomas is ticketed for not wearing a seatbelt and driving without a license. Later that same day, Thomas is pulled over again by a different officer and ticketed for driving without a license. In fact, in just more than two months, Thomas was pulled over 11 times by six different white officers and four black officers. They cited Thomas for 21 violations, almost all of them for the exact same things, not wearing a seatbelt or driving without a license. Driving without a license is a criminal offense and can be dangerous, which is why the law requires people to take a test to get their license. Was there ever a point where you just said, you know, Timothy, Get your license. Wake up. That was a point when we had conversations like that. It's actual several points in time we had conversations like that. Nothing should have cost him his life that night. And at the same time, I, I know people will also be thinking, if he'd just gotten his driver's license, if he just hadn't run, he'd still be here. But what did you do when you were 19? Did you always think, regardless of what your parents taught you, how they brought you up, did you always think first? While it's clear Thomas broke the law, repeatedly driving without a license, the reason his tickets may be an indication of something larger is this. Think about it. Driving without a license is a non-moving violation that police can only detect after they've pulled you over. It's not a moving violation like running a red light, something police can see as you drive by. And driving without a seatbelt that's an infraction that police must look very closely to spot. So the question is, if Thomas was being ticketed for infractions that were either difficult or impossible to see, why was he being pulled over in the first place? A mother may be the last person to ask this to, but any way, shape, and form you think your, your son might have been hooked up with the drug tray? Oh, no. I mean, if he was a drug dealer... He, he was, was like, the brokest one you would ever meet. Legally, police must have a justifiable reason to pull someone over. The officer who tried to stop Thomas the night he was shot said he recognized him after ticketing the young man a year earlier. We asked Roger Webster, who was then the head of the Cincinnati Police Union, why he thought Thomas had been pulled over and given so many non-moving violations. It's generally a cop trying to be a nice guy and say, well, I'm not going to cite you with... Uh, running that stop sign, I'll just give you a seatbelt violation, or I'll give you a no driver's license. You get your driver's license, take it to court, and it'll be over and done with. And that's generally what it is. Had 10 different officers all really just been nice guys, pulling Thomas over for running a stop sign or speeding, but only once issuing him a moving violation? Or was something else going on? Was this guy being profiled in some way? It's very hard to tell 
the color of the driver of the car at night. A lot of these are middle of the day. A lot of them are middle of the day. And, and again, it's, it's hard to see in, into a vehicle in the daytime um, and, and tell what color the driver is in a split second. Uh, to say, well, there goes a black guy, I'm going to stop him, he probably doesn't have a driver's license. I, you know, I, I can't see an officer doing that. But Timothy's brother, Terry, says officers routinely pulled over Timothy for the same reason they pull over most of the young men in the neighborhood. Because they're black, and he says police view them with more suspicion. They figure they out there selling drugs, and I mean, yeah, it's a few drug dealers, but you can't just point them out and say, yeah, he a drug dealer. If you ain't seen him or know he doing it, you can't just point them out, but that's what they was doing. They was just picking you out the crowd, and Tim got picked out a lot of times, but they didn't have no reason to pick him out. It's a charge the Cincinnati police vehemently deny. Not in Cincinnati. Ever. Ever. Um, you know, it, it's suspicious behavior. To say that a guy is stopped because he's, he's one color or another color, I don't think so. I don't believe so. I don't believe we've done it. And I don't know of anybody that's out there that's doing it. Look at the total picture of what's going on before we go out and accuse the cops of racial profiling. Look at the total picture? Fair enough. So Dateline began one of the most ambitious statistical projects of this kind ever undertaken. Before our investigation was over, we would gather, sort, and analyze more than 300,000 traffic tickets in Cincinnati and more than 4 million tickets in major cities across the country. We were looking for new, conclusive answers to the question, are black drivers routinely being racially profiled, pulled over because they're black? We now continue with a pattern of suspicion on Dateline with Stone Phillips. How you doing, sir? When I stop cars, I really could care less what the race of the person is. Do you have any identification on you? Do Cincinnati police racially profile black drivers, using traffic stops in a way that denies them their basic constitutional right of equal treatment under the law? In an effort to find out, Dateline pulled more than 300,000 traffic tickets issued to Cincinnati drivers from 1998 to 2002. What we found was a clear pattern. Overall, Cincinnati police ticketed black and white drivers equally, except when it came to the types of tickets issued Timothy Thomas, driving without a seatbelt or license, violations that are difficult or impossible to spot until after you've been pulled over. When it came to these types of tickets, we found Cincinnati police ticketed black drivers at a rate three times that of white drivers. We asked Cincinnati's police union president, Roger Webster, whether this might be evidence Cincinnati police are racially profiling. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm saying that the guys that I know and the Cincinnati cops that I know don't do that as a practice. We don't do it, we haven't done it, and we won't do it. The statistics themselves hinge on the amount of crime in those communities. Author and Hoover Institute fellow Shelby Steele believes the reason for the disproportionate stops is not racial profiling, but the uncomfortable truth that blacks commit a disproportionate amount of violent crime. It's the elephant in the room that, that we can't talk about. I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of crime in inner city America. And so the question really is, are police stops proportionate to the amount of crime in that, in that community? If we look at the numbers in that way, we may find that uh, those communities are under-policed. But Dateline found that in low-crime neighborhoods, outside Cincinnati's inner city, police are pulling over and ticketing blacks for non-moving violations at disproportionate rates there as well. And the disproportionate rates hold there, too. Well, so what would what would your point be then? Blacks are being pulled over in low crime, frequently white neighborhoods, where there doesn't seem to be a lot of pressure to fight crime. Maybe they're pulled over for very good reasons. Maybe they're committing more crime in those neighborhoods than, than other people are. We showed Dateline's research to law professor and former prosecutor David Harris, who had a very different opinion of our data. It's a very powerful piece of evidence. When you look at that, when you see that pattern, what you're seeing is that discretion that the police have is being used much differently in minority communities than it is in white communities. And it's being used 
in ways that allow police to have an excuse or a pretext to do searches, to do questioning, to do the kinds of things that they don't do elsewhere. Harris has studied racial profiling for years and authored a book called Profiles in Injustice. He says Dateline's research offers a window into how he believes Cincinnati police use their discretion, using minor traffic stops as a way to scrutinize people, to search them for guns, drugs, or outstanding warrants. What's the matter with that? I mean, the courts have given police officers wide discretion. The problem is, the wider your discretion and the less regulated your discretion, the more you're subject to the possibility of abuse. Police officers will tell you, the traffic code is my best friend. I know I can stop pretty much anybody I want to. If I follow them for a few blocks, it's all legal. Harris says Dateline's research shows African Americans in Cincinnati are disproportionately the subjects of such selective law enforcement. In other words, black Americans are being racially profiled. And judging by the ticketing pattern, Harris says it's likely Timothy Thomas was too. It's a fishing expedition. He was being focused on, and they were watching him, and these violations are not the kinds of things you see from the outside of the car. He was being stopped, he was being checked, and then whatever they found, they were citing him for. The argument is that these tickets are issued when there are moments of suspicion. In other words, you suspect something, you think these people might be criminals, and they're being checked out. These tickets show up when no dope was found, no guns were found. Mm -hmm. True? Yes. I've, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the way I do police work, yes. Yeah. If it is a legitimate violation that I can issue a legitimate legal ticket for, and I do it because I think you're in my neck of the woods doing something you are not supposed to be doing, yes. And in Thomas's case, look how it played out. Dateline discovered that Thomas appeared in court more than 21 separate times in an effort to settle his traffic violations, even spending two weeks in jail when he couldn't pay the rising penalties and fines. But the fines kept coming. His younger brother, Terry. Everything, it just kept piling. It's like he would go to court for one, maybe spend eight hours in there for one, and another one would come. It was like they never went away. Eventually, Thomas missed court dates. Arrest warrants were issued, and twice he chose to run from police rather than spend more time in jail. Well, we have a suspect male black, about six foot, red bandana, and uh, about 14 warrants on him. So those ominous sounding 14 warrants for his arrest on the night he was shot were not for any serious criminal activity, but all resulting from his traffic tickets. <laughs> Timothy Thomas should not have driven without a license, but when this is used as a way to stop him, just to check him out, what we've got is a system that allows an end run around the Constitution. A system that appears to target African Americans because of the color of their skin. We wondered, was this just Cincinnati's problem? How would other cities across the United States fare when we examined them? Using open records laws in different states, Dateline compiled and analyzed every single traffic stop or ticket issued in more than a dozen major cities where race was noted. More than four million stops or tickets overall. We used every bit of data that was available, data in many cases that has never been analyzed before. From San Diego to Boston, we found patterns of uneven law enforcement and stories of African Americans like those Dateline gathered here, all law-abiding citizens who appear to have been stopped by police because of the color of their skin. I always feel like I'm under attack by the law. Andrew Coffer of St. Louis, Missouri, a 17-year-old honor student who says he was pulled over several times on his way to high school. Were you wearing anything that... that could have gotten you in trouble? I went to a private high school. There was a dress code, so we could wear no blue jeans. It had to be a collar shirt, uh, khakis. He says police would often give him no reason for the stop. Andrew's father, Andre Coffer, has little trouble believing his son. Andre is an accountant, a Sunday school teacher, and owns his own business. 
He says police have pulled him over more than 20 times. What kind of reasons do they give you for pulling you over? We've had a lot of burglaries in the area. You're in a nice car. Uh, you know, is this your car? Uh, you know, problem with your license plate, tail light, just any, you know, anything to pull you over. We keep some bail money at home just in case I get locked up so that, you know, I can, I can get out. We told the group, in almost every city Dateline examined across the country, police pulled over and ticketed blacks for non-moving violations at a rate higher than whites. In Minneapolis and Houston, we found police stopped blacks for non-moving violations at a rate 50% higher than whites. In Massachusetts, we looked at ticketing patterns in Springfield, Worcester, and Boston. In all of them, police ticketed black drivers at a rate three times higher than white drivers. This Boston civic leader says that doesn't surprise him because he's been pulled over. He said your registration had expired. Well, I knew that was incorrect because I had just recently renewed my registration. Did you ever feel like, well, maybe I should complain about this to the president of the NAACP? No, because I was the president of the NAACP. <laughs> In Kansas City, Missouri, St. Louis, and San Diego, Dateline's research revealed black drivers are twice as likely to be stopped and ticketed for non-moving violations. Janice Jones says it happened to her in St. Louis as she pulled out of a gas station. I asked him, Officer, why did you pull me over? He says, because you have no headlights. I tell him, Officer, I do have headlights. They automatically come on when you turn my car on. Her husband, the former press secretary for the mayor of East St. Louis, says it happened to him, too, but not nearly as many times as it's happened to his son. One or two times? No. Higher. Ten? Higher. Fifteen? Higher. Get out of here. No, sir. How many times do you think they pulled him over? A, a, a little over 20 times. In Denver, police stopped African Americans for non-moving violations more than three times the rate of whites. These four high school friends from Denver say they've all been stopped in the last year for what they believe to be ridiculous reasons. Oh, well, your tire was kind of low, so that's why we pulled you over. He sticks his head inside of my car and starts looking around and points to the air freshener in my window and says he pulled me over for the air freshener. They're just pulling you over to see if you have drugs, guns, or anything else, see if you got warrants or anything like that. And that angers Vietnam veteran James Bonds from Worcester, Massachusetts, who says it happened to him in Shrewsbury, coming home from a Veterans of Foreign Wars meeting. You know, sitting here hearing um, these other stories, I'm really appalled. These young people here, especially from um, Denver, these are the guys that we send to Iraq to drive the Humvees, to drive the, the Jeeps. They don't get racial profile over there, but they can't drive the kind of car that they want here in their own country. I think America should be ashamed. And in Dayton, Ohio and Richmond, Virginia, police ticketed black drivers for non-moving violations at a rate three times higher than whites. And again, it wasn't just in high crime inner cities, but also in low crime neighborhoods in cities across the country. I've seen surveys in cities where the evidence is pretty convincing, but I've never seen a nationwide study like the one you've done. We asked civil rights leader and national chairman of the NAACP, Julian Bond, to look at our findings. What do you make of this? There's no explanation for this except that this is racial profiling. This is police seeing a black person and saying, I suspect that person more than I suspect a white person, and I'm going to stop him, I'm going to ask him questions, and I wouldn't do that to a white person. The police say that just isn't so. In fact, in two cities, Nashville, Tennessee, and Hartford, Connecticut, there was no significant difference in the way whites and blacks were stopped. Remember, we did find blacks ticketed at a much higher rate for non-moving violations in 12 other cities. But the police in those cities told us race plays absolutely no role in how they issue tickets. The police said they are committed to fair and equal treatment of all citizens. So what accounts for the disproportionate ticketing of African Americans that we discovered? Police in Houston, Cincinnati, Kansas City, Springfield, and St. Louis all told us economic forces may be a factor. As the St. Louis police put it, inner city black drivers may have fewer resources to rectify equipment problems. 
Other police departments told us that aggressive policing in inner city black communities by definition means more police stops and more tickets being issued. They say that stops criminals and protects victims of crime. Author Shelby Steele believes racial profiling is not the problem. One of the things that bothers me is the fact that when we intimidate the police and back them up and make them afraid to police inner city communities, then those communities become more vulnerable to crime because the police say, I'm not going to go in there and have you call me a racist. I'm not going to do my job. And so then there's the drug business right there in the black community allowed to thrive. 35 million African Americans in this country. I mean, the overwhelming majority of African Americans aren't criminals. Should they be treated any differently when they drive down the road by police just because of the color of their skin? Absolutely not. But this is the irony. If I live in that neighborhood, I want the pretext stop. Uh, if I'm raising children in that neighborhood, I want to feel that it's being policed. Do you see the crack de crackheads back there? Yes, I do. You I can call them. us. You know, what you do you say us. to police officers that are working in some of these most desperate neighborhoods where the people are, are, are crying for police protection, where drugs have just sort of shredded the fabric of the community? And they're saying, hey, we've got to use every tactic we have. We're fighting a losing battle here. Cut us some slack. I want to say I want you to be aggressive, I want you to do your job, but I want you to use techniques that aren't dependent on racial profiling. I want you to do your job in a fair and just manner, and if you do that, the community will applaud. In February of 2001, during his first address to Congress, President Bush made a bold promise. Earlier today, I asked John Ashcroft, the Attorney General, to develop specific recommendations to end racial profiling. It's wrong, and we will end it in America. The Justice Department announced it would begin investigating local police departments across the country. But that announcement was made just one day before the world changed. As the images of September 11th seared the nation, racial profiling instantly was no longer such a dirty word. Many began wondering if racial profiling was a necessary evil. After all, all the hijackers had been Middle Eastern. Yet even the current New York City Police Commissioner, Raymond Kelly, who you'd think might be tempted to endorse racial profiling after 9-11, does not. I think it's dumb policing, uh, much too much of a, uh, of a broad brush. We need specific information. When Kelly became Commissioner of U.S. Customs in 1998, the department faced allegations of racial profiling. Charges agents were unfairly searching a disproportionate number of minorities for drugs. Kelly demanded new accountability from his customs agents. They began documenting the race of each individual they searched and the reason for the search. What happened? The number of drug searches dropped by 75 percent, but the drug seizures went up. Any notion that somehow stopping someone simply because of their race is intelligent policing uh, is not something that I support and I think uh, it's supported by any of, of the evidence. But while law enforcement officials from the president on down say racial profiling is wrong and ineffective on the street not everyone can agree where aggressive policing ends and racial profiling begins. Last week we stopped the car downtown loud music Pulled him over, he had felony drug warrants. That's how we police. Small things lead to big things. I think the police ought to go where the crime is, and they ought to be professional about the way that they conduct their business. Having said that, I don't think racial profiling is much of a problem for black Americans today. Still, national civil rights leader Julian Bond questions whether the ends justify the means. You're driving a wedge between you and the people who want your protection more than anybody else in the community. And until you overcome this enormous handicap that you've imposed, you're not going to be effective law enforcement officers. And what happened to the president's pledge to end racial profiling? This June, the U.S. Justice Department announced without fanfare its response, a new federal ban on racial profiling. The new federal guidelines spell out that in the making of routine law enforcement decisions, such as deciding which motorists to stop for traffic infractions, consideration of the driver's race or ethnicity is absolutely forbidden. 
The ban, however, has no effect on local police. Not in Cincinnati, Houston, St. Louis, or any other city's police department. And it lacks two elements, experts argue, are necessary. Requirements that police record who is stopped and why, and penalties for police who racially profile. Requirements many oppose. Without penalties, without sanctions, without record-keeping requirements, and without some punishment for failing to keep those records, then this practice will continue. We asked the Justice Department for an interview to explain how its ban would change things, and it declined, leaving many Americans, including the mother of Timothy Thomas, wondering who will ensure that all Americans will be treated equally under the law. It's totally different when you're a person of African American descent. It's as if no matter what you do, you're guilty until proven innocent. Timothy Thomas's mother and several other Cincinnati residents who were plaintiffs in the racial profiling lawsuit against the city settled. Although the police department denied any wrongdoing, the $4.5 million settlement was the largest in the city's history. Cincinnati and other cities tell us they train their officers and check their performance to make sure they are not profiling. For more information about our report, log on to our website. The address is dateline.msnbc.com.